right, right, right. It is the Dead Man's Tone Podcast. I'm your host, Mr. Dead Man. And this is the show that's broadcast live deep in the heart, deep in the heart from a tra- trailer park in Meth County, Texas. Now, this is also the show that's been banned on YouTube because this voice that you're hearing is just too damn sexy. And I'm not making that up. Susan Wajikikiki, whatever her last name is, decided to send me an email one day saying that your channel is completely demonetized. Completely demonetized because the bulk of the content is sexually gratifying. And my voice you're hearing is the bulk of that content. So if it gets you off, that's why. That's why. Okay. Uh, other news. I got sad news I got to say here. Um, first off, John Everson, how you doing? I'm doing good. It's good to have you. I'm glad you're doing well. Uh, but I've got some sad news. Uh, Uh-oh. See? See, people think I'm lying about the trailer park thing. They're like, no, you don't really live in a trailer park. I, I do. I do actually live in a trailer park. Let me, uh, for those watching the live stream, let me post an image of what the trailer park looks like. It looks like uh, this. That's my trailer, and that's me in front of it giving a thumbs up. It's clearly not green screened at all. Look, coronavirus finally happened in this trailer park. One infected, and it was an instant death. Like with the three weeks it died. I, it's so sorry. It's so sad. So sad. I thought for the longest time we would be good. I thought we would be good because after all, no one here in this trailer park gives a flying fuck about hygiene. Oh, Smelly Kelly stinks like ass because the only time she bathes is when it rains. So, and, and she's not an exception. She's not an exception, John. She's not. She's, she's one of the usual. That's the norm. People think I'm It'll weird for right. actually bathing twice a week. <laughs> Should I, be in Chicago. We just went through a downpour. <laughs> See, that, that would have been a nice shower for her. I thought the decades of unwashed hands and sweaty trailer orgies, trailer park orgies, would build our immune system up to where you know we would be fine. But no, Smelly Kelly, she got infected, and three weeks later she's dead. So I have to, I have to take a shot of. Um, uh, see, I got some Woodford Reserve here. I'll take a shot of that. Hey, you know, I'll just drink it out from the bottle. It's for Smelly Kelly. I'm gonna do, do that. Anyway, while I do this, John Everson. For the, for the for those that are watching right now listening, I always start off with one question: Who are you, and what do you do? Uh, I'm a dude who writes horror stories uh, a lot. Uh, you know, um, book stories. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I am. I like that. A dude who writes horror stories. Now, how long have you been writing? I actually published my very first story in a magazine in 1994. So you do the math. Um, I'm not going to. 1994? Uh, so 16 years? Right? Uh, uh, I think you'd I think be so. lost. Uh, I, I think you're missing a, a 10. I think I'm missing a 10. 26. I don't know. I don't, I don't <laughs> care. I'm horrible. I'm horrible with math, too. Uh, that's why I am doing this and not anything else. <laughs> um, but so for a long time. Okay. And so why write? And why horror? That's a, a great question because I grew up not reading horror. Um, I was actually a sci-fi brat. Uh, I used to go to the library and drag home every science fiction book that I could find. Read them all. Uh, loved Asimov and Simak and Clement and Anderson and all those people. Total golden age sci-fi guy. Uh, and... Uh, For whatever reason, when I actually went to start writing, all these creepy things came out. The endings always were bad. I think Mm. uh, I was I was I was ruined by Twilight Zone and Outer Limits and Night Gallery. Uh, Well, I wouldn't call it ruined. You know, (laughs) it's more like perspective was gained from that. You know. Yep. Not to mention Kolchak, the Night Stalker. Mm. You know, this was like two times in a row that that has been mentioned. I'm really? Right. Yeah, yeah. The 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 previous guest, uh, By- Byron Kraft, he mentioned that as well. All right. Oh, nice. Yeah. No, the, okay. one of the coolest things in uh, in my career actually was years and years uh, after I started writing, uh, I suddenly got asked to write a Kolchak story for an anthology. Oh. So that must that gave cool. me a good excuse to go back grab the DVDs and watch the entire series start to finish before I wrote my story 
Man, and that must have felt awesome. That was that was pretty cool. I bet. So, I crossed paths with you because uh, I saw a, a promo on Covenant. Now, I understand you've been writing for a while, have many books out there, but, you know, sometimes there's, there's an author that you haven't really stumbled upon until it happens. And it just so happened, like, I think a couple months ago. I was like, Covenant, wow, this looks really good. Let me read it. And I got to tell you, I'm only on book one so far, and I'm I'm absolutely loving it. I'm I'm loving it. It's like a, a small town secrets get exposed with a journalist who's actually doing journalism. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> you know, not just using tweets or whatever. You know, um, I I'm I'm loving it so much. So, so tell, tell me about this book. Tell me about Covenant. Like like why, um, like what was what was the thought process behind it? So Covenant goes back to those early 90s, actually. Um, I <clears throat> I had published a few stories, and one day my boss came in to me and drops, because remember, this is like 94, <laughs> dropped paper on my desk, a newspaper, and said, hey, saw this and thought of you. There's this article about this cliff in England where like people, it's the most popular suicide cliff. People go up, have a last drink at a bar, and jump off. And... I was like, wow, that's pretty creepy. You're right. And then, you know, set it aside. Didn't didn't do anything with it right away. But every now and then I like, I put it in my idea file. And every now and then it came up. And probably mm. a year or maybe a little less later, I started going, maybe I could do something with this and started writing a story. Except in that thing, it was suicides off a cliff that sort of start the book. But the book isn't about the suicides. It's about this demonic force that has the town in its thrall. Um, and so... Covenant started, it kind of, it was one of those books because I was a short story writer that, you know, it, it came out of the drawer. I wrote a few chapters. I went, I'll never finish this. I put it back in the drawer. A couple of years would go by, I'd take it back out. And I, sorry, five sorry? years before I had a first draft of that book. I'm sorry. Oh no. It looked like uh, we lost connection for, uh, for a little bit. It's okay. It's okay. We're still here. No. Okay. But yeah, so it started off as a short story. It was a rough draft. You didn't really, I guess you didn't really want to finish it, I guess. And eventually you did. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to finish it. I just didn't believe I could because mm. I was, you know, at that point I was a short story writer. I, I would sit down on a Sunday. I'd write a short story, start to finish, it'd be done. And that was it. You know, writing a novel is a completely different exercise. And there's a lot of words there. Uh, it, it's hard to hard to believe the first time that you can actually get to the finish line. Yeah, it is a lot. It it is very different. I mean, you are, you're taking a story and and making it longer and you're going to have to make it uh, compelling for each chapter. I mean, uh, otherwise it's like, you're just drawing it on and kind of losing the interest. Um, But, and and how was that process for you? I mean, how did, how did you shift gears from writing short stories to, uh, to, to writing a novel? Well, it was it was kind of organic because over the 90s, I was still writing short stories most of the time and tinkering with the novel. Once I finished the novel and sold it, then I was like, hmm, I guess I should write another novel. Um, and that's when I started on Sacrifice. I actually used National Novel Writing Month, NaNoWriMo, for people who've done that. That's uh, a thing every November where people all pledge writers go in and say, I'm going to write a novel start to finish in November, 50,000 words. Um, and so I use that back in, I think it was 2002 or three. I use that as my jump off point to try to write a full blown second book. Um, but I tried to write a standalone book because I still hadn't actually sold covenant the first one. And yet I still wanted to tell this other story in the same world. Um, so once I did 50,000 words in a month, I realized, okay, I can do this novel thing. I finished one once. I wrote 50,000 words in a month. Yeah, I can do this. And once you get that, once your sort of rhythm changes, um, at this point, it's really hard for me to sit down and write a 2000 word short story because, you know, I'm used to sitting down and writing 2000 words and it's barely a chapter. I mean, I would imagine so. Fifty? You said fifty thousand words in a day? No, no, no. Uh, non- National Novel Writing Month is you're supposed to write a completed. It's a very short novel when you define novel. You're supposed to write a completed novel, fifty thousand words or more, in a month. Uh, in a month, all in November. Okay. And just the make whole sure point you got of the right. yeah, the whole point of it is 
get the editor off your back. Don't second guess yourself. Just sit down and churn out words every single day and, you know, don't get caught up in the self-doubt and everything. You can if you're going to write that many words in a month. You just have to spew words and come back and edit later. And that's a pretty valuable lesson for writers who can get hung up on, you know, oh my God, that sentence is still not right. And they spend, you know, three hours trying to fix a paragraph. It's like, no, fix the whole, get the whole story on paper and edit later. Now, NaNoWriMo has been around for a while. And I, and I appreciate how it pushes people to, I guess, become more disciplined. Now, has it become more of a, of a fad? I honestly don't know because I did it the one time and I've never, I've never participated since. Mm-hmm. It helped me. It, it kind of proved something to me that I could, I could really produce a lot of content in a very short amount of time if I put my mind to it. And that was the most valuable lesson. Um, since then, you know, m- most of my novels now take me five, six, seven months to write. I, I don't try to do it in a month. That's, I have a day job. I don't really have that. <laughs> it, it, it impacted my health severely. I can tell you that the, the oh. month after I did national novel writing month, I was sick for a couple of weeks. Like you were cutting off food. Like what? You- no, I was, I was just exhausted because I was burning the candle at both ends. I was getting up at five in the morning, writing for a couple hours, going to work for 10 hours, coming home, writing until midnight. You know, I was, it was exhausting. But this, I'm glad we're talking about this because a lot of writers do listen to the show and uh, some of them, they lose the motivation. You know, they lose the motivation, which I you know, suppose happens low sales sometimes, whatever. Maybe you lose interest in the story. Maybe it's a uh, lack of confidence. But in this month that you sat down and and just wrote all these words out, like I guess the question is how how did you do it? Like what was the pro like how did you make it work? Uh you <laughs> I mean that's that's a great question, but I think the only real answer is you just do it. I know. Um, right? The answer is you know, simple. It's, <laughs> you just do it, but it's like it's it's like every it's like day, how <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. What the only the reason that I write, and and the kinds of stories and the books that I write, are things. They're stories that I want to read. Okay, so when I sit down to write a book or a story, whatever it is, I'm try. I'm telling myself a story. Um, sometimes I don't feel like it. A lot of times I don't feel like it, and that's where the discipline comes in. Where you say, you know, shut up, sit your ass down, and get the work done. Um, but at the end of the day, if you train your brain to just sit down, you will not leave this chair until you type X number of words. That that's a great motivator. Okay. In, in this moment, like we're talking about cutting off from distractions, no social media, no Facebook or Twitter or you know, bullshit video games or Netflix or whatever. We're talking about just sit down and you're, and you're working on your book. Yep. That's it. I mean, that's it. I, it, it, what about, what about with writer's block? I mean, have you ever has that ever been a factor? Uh, to me, writers, and I, I don't know. I mean, for me, writer's block is I don't feel like writing. It's not that I can't write. It's not that I can't force things to appear on the page. It's that I don't feel like concentrating. And so that's what I have to overcome if, I, if I'm if i being slow to get work done. Mm-hmm. Um, it, yeah, I get that. Is there something, it's like, oh, am I, am I just putting it off, procrastinating, stuff like that. And some people, like, they look at their procrastination as, as writer's block when really it's not writer's block. It's just they're just being lazy, you know, and to put it yep. bluntly. Um, so for the writers listening, hey, if you're stuck on a book and you're like, man, I, I want to get the short story done, but you haven't been doing it, just, I guess, look at what you've been doing. Like, if you're not writing, what are you doing with your time? You know? Yep. I mean... Here's the thing. When I started out, I was a journalist, which is why the lead character of Covenant is a journalist. That's what I knew. Um, And as a journalist, you don't have the luxury of saying, yeah, you know, I don't feel like doing that thousand word story today. Because guess what? It's your paycheck. Mm -hmm. You do the thousand word story. I don't care what the hell you feel like it. And if you're going to be a professional writer in fiction as well as nonfiction, you have to produce content or you starve. Now, I don't make my living off fiction writing. I'll say that right up front. But there are plenty of people who do. Right. And I'm sure they would all say exactly the same thing. Look, 
yes, there's some inspiration involved, but there's also a lot of perspiration. It's about just digging in and doing the work. So you don't make a living off it, but you do make, I'm, I'm guessing you make some money to, I guess, fun money, if you will, like uh, money to blow on things. Whether be, um, my, my vice is cigars and, of course, whiskey. Um, but I, I take it you make at least a, a that much, something for fun. No, I do. I do have fun. Uh, you know, my my deal with my family has always been what I make from writing uh, goes into its own account. It pays for expenses related to writing, like traveling to conventions and world horror cons and such. Um, and it pays for most of the things I have in my basement, which <laughs> I have pinball machines. I have a big screen TV. I've got, you know, a big bar that I built, air hockey table. I've got lots of fun toys that yeah. writing is funded. So I always tell my editor, come on, we need a new book. It's uh, the basement that horror uh, built. Needs another pinball machine. See that? See that sounds great. I like hearing that because while many people are like, "Man, I'm not making a month, I'm making a living off my work yet." You're at least in, while you still have your job, your day job, you are able to with the funds, with the money you do make off your work, have fun with it. Yeah, it's paying for the, for the expenses and all that, but there's also there's you show me images of your uh, like man cave basement thing. It, it looks incredible. You got pinball machines. You got a a bar with was a beer on tap. I saw. Uh, those are fake taps. So oh, a, man. A, a few years ago, we had a, a flood in the basement uh, mm. because the sump pump froze. And so I had to pull all the carpeting. And I said, you know, I don't do woodwork, but I've always wanted to have an oak bar. And anytime I've priced them, they're ridiculous. And I couldn't find one that was prefab that was going to fit the space right anyway. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm going to attempt to build a bar. So I watched all these YouTube videos and uh, – read this one guy's blog who is amazing. I like read it 50 times and I bought the equipment and I sat down and bought all the wood and I, I made it happen and I built this bar. And then what's really amusing and, and for, for the writers in the audience, so it would be great if I monetized this page. But what I did was I documented all the steps for building the bar mm -hmm. and put it on my blog. And that page gets more hit in a given day than all of the fiction pages on the site give in a month. Oh, <laughs> I got to say that bar looked looks very impressive. I saw that I was like, "Oh, crap. That that looks uh, expensive." You, know, you made that yourself. I didn't write it as oh, man. I didn't write it as clickbait, but man, lots of people have read how to build a home oak bar from from my blog. <laughs> hey, hey, there's that. But what's really cool but, though is that your writing helped pay for that. And and for those listening, in case you're discouraged, like, oh, it won't pay my bills, maybe it could. Maybe it could if you, you put the money that way. Uh, here you listen to uh, Everson talk about how it's, it went towards, uh, you know, the stuff in his basement. We're talking about pinball machines, and those things aren't cheap, right? Nope, nope. And it helped pay for a pit kitchen remodel, and at the Same. moment I'm saving up, saving up for a car next year. So. And, and how many books do you have out there? Uh, there are... What are we? Do? What are we at? Novel number twelve is coming out this fall. Um, I'm writing thirteen right now, and then I have four short story collections and uh, several books that I edited and published because I actually run a small press called Dark Arts Books, um, which is kind of inactive at the moment. Um, okay. I started started it before my career really had taken off, um, and so we published a bunch of anthologies and. One of our anthologies was a Bram Stoker nominee, and it did really well. Um, and then pretty much the ebook revolution hit, and my novels started doing well. And so at this point, it's kind of more of an archival press, but it still exists. It's at darkartsbooks.com. Okay. okay, and I definitely want to get into the uh, the publishing side of things and, and your, your, your opinions on that. Uh, before I do so, uh, before I go all that far, let, let me go make sure cover Covenant real fast. And... Any other books you want to talk about? Because you have, you have a lot of books that we can get into here. Now, Covenant. While the <laughs> character was based on, it sounds like based on you and based on your experience as, as a journalist, there are so many characters, especially the female characters, that were very, very vivid, very well described. Uh, you, you have a talent for that, sir. You definitely do. <laughs> Thank um, you. Are they based on any any people? Anyone in Not really. I, I really have not. I've, I've tried not to base characters on people in general because I think that gets people into trouble. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's fiction. It's fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I try to write saucy, snotty, smarmy 
funny characters um, that hopefully people enjoy reading. Wow. I definitely enjoyed reading them. Now, were there any um, hurdles or obstacles that you had to overcome with Covenant? <laughs> yeah, proving to myself I could actually finish it. Uh, <laughs> There's that one. I mean, that, There's that one. That was really the biggest one. I mean, the second one was getting it sold because at that point I'd only written short stories in a bunch of small magazines. And, you know, I, I shopped that book around to every publisher on earth. I, don't, I have an entire folder of rejections for that book. Ultimately, it came out in a small press, which I was pleased that it finally came out. But, you know, my goal was to be on mass market bookstore shelves. So um, I wasn't you know, super happy about that, but at least it came out and then it won an award. And then suddenly it gained a little bit of legs, but it still took a couple of years before I finally was able to sell it to leisure books in 2007. Um, and that's when the novel career really took off because then I actually had books in bookstores all around the country for the next several years. Oh, that's very impressive. So it did get a number of rejections and like how many rejections are we talking about? Like it, I have a folder full of them. I mean, I sent that book to every agent, every publisher at the time who was doing horror. I mean, it was everywhere. Everywhere. So it's been rejected. It's been rejected. But it finally, finally, you, you break ground. You get somewhere with it. And it, it's, it wins an award. What award are we talking about here? It was the Bram Stoker Award for first novel back in. It, I won it in 2005 for the book that came out in 2004. And this is your first novel. Your first novel that yep. you were like, oh, I don't know if I can write this. It won an award like like that. Well, I make it sound so simple. Not like that. Not like a snap, but it took a lot of work, but you, you got it, man. It was it was an amazing moment, um, especially since at that particular awards ceremony, that was a weird time because my wife was uh, three weeks away from her due date with our son. Um, and yet I was up for this big national award and I had to fly to the coast to receive it. And I didn't know if I could go. We actually talked to her doctor to say, is it safe for me to go to the other end of the country? I don't know if I'm going to win it, but you know, what the heck? He's like, yes, you should, you should go. You can get back in a few hours. You, it'll be fine. And it was, um, that award ceremony, Clive Barker was there, which was super cool. So, you know, I was there with him. Uh, Chuck Palahniuk was there. Oh, wow. Um, it was it was an amazing, an amazing weekend. You got to, you got to exchange words with them. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, what was nice. funny is actually, I had actually interviewed Clive a couple of years earlier, uh, when he was on a tour for the great and secret show. I think that's the way this went. I don't think it was after, um, and I was working for the newspaper and he was coming through town on a junket to produce, to promote that and Nightbreed both at the same time, the movie. Um, so I have a big, uh, beautiful illustration he did in my copy of Great and Secret Show um, because he signed it while I was interviewing him. Oh, nice. And that's something you keep, right? I mean, you're, you, like, there's no price to sell that. Well, hell thing. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. That is that is pretty good for first novel. Uh, you know, there's other people out there that's like, but I have like five novels. I haven't received any awards or done anything. It's like, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. You know? Well, <sighs> it's I, I, would, I would say it's got to be harder than ever to win an award in this climate. Mm -hmm. uh, because with the age of, of self and independent publishing just exploding or has exploded, you know, the, the content out there is a hundred times what it was 20 years ago. Um, the amount of stuff that's published every single day, it's amazing. It's a, it's a glut of content. It's like probably like a hundred thousand, probably millions of stuff uploaded every day. I, I don't even, I don't even know what the numbers are, but it's just, everyone can do it at any time. And, you know, it has to be a bunch, a yeah. massive amount. Well, and uh, as, as most people would tell you, anyone could do it, but not everyone should do it. That is that is true. Um, and what happens is they put it out there and it gets no attention. Or sometimes they put stuff out there and you're like, what is this? And that stuff somehow manages to get attention. It's like, I, I, that wasn't any good. What? But whatever. Oh. You just never know what's going to strike the chord. Yeah. Not anymore, anyway. So, now, a title like Covenant, 
I know I asked this, uh, what we're talking before we start went live. Are you a religious man by any chance? I, I'm really not. Um, not. No, I was raised Catholic. I, I'm, I'm more agnostic at this point. Um, you know, I'm not saying there's no God. I, I'm, I'm not saying there is. Yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure with the name Covenant, I was like, I don't know what's going on here. Okay. Now we've got some questions in the chat I'm going to ask from uh, Martin uh, Munt. Uh, hey, John, write a story in a day. Prolific. So you write a story in a, in a given day? Martin Munt is one of the best short story writers you will ever, ever read. And he is trolling the chat here. That is hilarious. <laughs> no, okay. he's not trolling the chat. Um, I am I am super, super proud. Um, Marty, I used to go see do live readings. Marty is the one guy who, when I listened to him read afterwards, my stomach hurt because I was doubled over laughing so hard. The story was so horror sick hilarious all at the same time loved it and years later i was actually privileged enough to publish him on my dark arts book imprint so thanks for stopping in marty yeah definitely thanks <laughs> for stopping in you. and asking the question um you know with this show being a smaller show than other things on youtube uh usually on youtube people send super chats or whatever it doesn't matter you my channel's completely demonetized <laughs> over something i was like what too sexually gratifying content. I have no idea what you're talking about. But anyway, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I guess maybe the mascot I use, just some Asian chick with a midriff showing. Pff, maybe I don't know. That that might have something to do with it. Maybe. Uh, but the mascot. I think you today's. should adopt the. Uh, you should adopt one of the nightwear covers. Ah, uh, oh, that would that would be nice. <laughs> those covers are very nice. We'll talk about those books pretty soon. Uh, another question: Do you plot your books out ahead of time before you start writing chapter one? Uh, that depends. So covenant sacrifice, the 13th, uh, redemption. Uh, what else? Ooh, there's one other, uh, house by the cemetery. None of those were really plotted out ahead of time. Total seat of your pants novels. Um, all of the rest I sold ahead of writing to the publisher, in which case you have to plot them ahead because you have to hand in an outline and say, here's what I want to write. Will you pay me for it? And they say yes or no. So there's the answer. Yeah, you got to plot it out sometimes. No, it's there's it's people are on both sides of that coin. I mean, if you have a really really detailed outline, it's certainly helpful um, because you don't paint yourself into corners. But it also can sometimes feel like you're writing a book that's paint by numbers when you're mm -hmm. actually sitting down to write it. Um, you know, so I try to make my outlines general enough that I've got lots of leeway to do interesting things and tell yeah. myself interesting stories that I didn't think of six months ago when I wrote the outline. Here's the thing, though, too. The people that are on the other side that say, oh, I never write an outline. I'm like, do you, though? Do you, though? Because I'm sure you're writing an outline in your head, kind of like with some forecasting. I mean, you kind of have an idea where it's going to go, maybe sort of, kind of. I mean, you're directing it a little bit, you know, it's like, oh yeah, it's, it's to me, it's sort of, you have visions, you have, yeah. you know, I kind of feel like he's going to, this thing is going to happen. And then you write around that thing. I don't know what's mm -hmm. going to happen around that thing, but I have this, this scene that I think is really intense that I want to write. When I was writing covenant, I'll be honest, I did not know how the book was going to end, which made it impossible to sell ahead of time to a publisher. Believe me, I tried and they were not happy when I kind of fudged and was like well um sort of this um i think it'll kind of be like <laughs> i didn't know how that book was gonna end now i haven't gotten to the ending of it so please don't don't spoil it away you know nope, I'll, no I'll spoilers away. And, and i'm surprised too that that's like your first book and that's the one i i, I read of yours um is that the book you would still recommend if, if for first time readers of uh john everson like would you recommend covenant or is there something else you would recommend it, it kind of depends what you like. Um, you know, I've written, I've written a lot of stuff about demon horror. So covenant certainly is that. Um, but you know, if you're, if you're not into demons, I wrote a novel about a siren and, and maybe that would be more your cup of tea. I wrote, you've got, uh, nightwear was, uh, another book of mine that got nominated for the Bram Stoker award. It was a finalist. That's a super extreme over the top erotic horror novel. That's going to be way too much for some people. 
other people that's like their favorite book of mine and they wish I would well, write another one. So, uh, I mean, I, there's, there's no beating around the bush on this one. I mean, I, I think it's pretty obvious as a, you know, I'm, Erotica and horror, yeah, that has my interest right there. I guess we could shift gears and talk, talk about uh, nightwear. Um, yeah, what was the uh, cliche question? What was inspiration, motivation behind this? <laughs> that one, you know, I, I honestly don't know where the original inspiration came from because that that idea is so old. I came up with that book idea back when I was still editing Covenant, so that tells you how old it was, and. Because I knew it was, it's basically the sex club from hell kind of book. I mean, it's okay. it's a, a a husband and wife are into the swinger scene, and well, she who's goes, not? "I mean, that's that's how you well, keep it lively, right?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, but she uh, goes way way deeper than him. I mean, she likes the violence, and 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 he basically is. They're lured into this strange club that only appears once a month, and you have to have an invitation to even find it. Um, and Wait, are they, are they careful about the once a month thing? I mean, do they time it right so that, <laughs> that way she's not on her flow or is that part of it too? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's kind of the Brigadoon of demonic, uh, sex clubs, I think. Okay. Um, and it's sort of, you know, the husband is basically ultimately in the position of trying to go into hell to save his wife. It's, it's a little bit of a Greek myth. Uh, play there okay but <laughs> nothing like the greek myths and he's in trying to go to hell to save his wife through a sex club i well, gotta, I gotta yeah. fuck all these chicks to go to hell so i can save you baby <laughs> i'm sorry i'm trying to save you, <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the content and and what i knew that book had what i knew had to be in that book in order for it to be the story I was afraid to write for the longest time. I wrote several novels before I even would approach it. And even when I was writing it, I was thinking of writing it under a pseudonym. Um, because that was that was actually one I wrote after the five book uh, mass market deal had ended because Leisure Books collapsed. I had, you know, I really was, I didn't have a publisher for a while. And when I landed, um, I followed my editor to Sam Hain. Um, and he said, what do you want to write? And I was like, how about we finally do that crazy ass book? <laughs> do that crazy and ass book, which which is I mean I don't see anything in your in your uh, catalog that seems like it's geared for kids or any anyone that would be like a prude about you know erotica horror stuff. No, <laughs> no, but this one is definitely the 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 most. Mm. Now, did you have any trouble with like Kindle? Or I'm sorry, Amazon like like blocking the book or anything? No, because it was it was put out through a big enough publisher that you know it was just it was just part of a line. Um, mm. It's never had any issues there. Uh, it actually also got picked up for translation in Germany, nice. um, and it's it's actually sold I think more copies in Germany than it has in oh, the of course, US. Yeah, they like the BDSM fisting stuff. I haven't read Nightwear yet. Is there fisting in was, Nightwear? I, I I I can't even answer that. Do you know what fisting is? Depends. I do, and it depends how you define it. Um, and I'm just oh no. Okay, you don't want to you don't want to define it here on the show. Okay, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll skip on that one. Um, okay, but nightwear. Ah, uh, well. Um, no, there's uh, there are more copies out in Germany, and it just came out in a Polish edition in March. So nice, done really well. And there's you have multiple books in this series. I'm really liking the covers too. It's they're very well. No, no, it's not a series. So it's that's not a why series? I sent you all. No, I sent you all the covers because each of those is a different edition. So oh wow, okay, okay. There was I... the original Sam Hain cover, and then there was uh, there was a limited edition cover, which is the more cartoony cover. Hmm. Um, and then there was a German cover, a Polish cover, and then when Sam Hain ultimately went belly up, um, I reissued. Uh, the book on my own dark arts wow. imprint. Have it's you thought about turning it into a series? I mean, is, it seems like, is that popular? I wrote a long novelette that's, uh, that follows it. Um, it's called field of flesh. Uh, so that's out there. And I've really, I've wanted to write a prequel ultimately. Um, and I've got an outline for it. It's just been hard because the original publisher is gone and it's not something I want to write and self publish. So, now, that is a pretty good title. The 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 flesh title that field of flesh. Well, that relates flesh. to 
yeah, there is a field of flesh in the novel nightwear, so that's a that's a direct mm. lean towards that. That's pretty cool. Um, were there are there any uh, chances for becoming a, like a, a movie or getting some sort of a deal or anything uh, like like a Netflix thing? It would be NC seventeen if it was. Uh. <laughs> so maybe uh, <laughs> maybe Pornhub or something. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was someone who who wanted to write. Uh, script for it and then he disappeared so uh, yeah i i, I kind of doubt that that's the one that's going to get produced if any get produced i've had options on a couple of things that ended up not okay. panning out but now you probably get this question a lot with this book um and i hate this question too but i'm gonna ask anyway because i hate cancel culture and all that but um uh, given the political climate how people are so touchy-feely about uh, content anymore do you get any problems with this book nightwear I get problems with all my books anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, Which the means first you're time writing I, good stuff. That that just means you're writing good stuff, honestly. Yeah. I, first time it, I saw it surface was a couple of years ago when I saw a couple of reviews saying he needs a sensitivity reader. It's like, <sighs> mm, what's I, th- that? <laughs> I can't because that. horror isn't meant for sensitivity. It's right. Uh, right. And the person should be sort of pushing person, some oh, boundaries. That's the point. I was gonna say that the person who who said that probably graduated from college, maybe, and and which is crazy because they're more like uh, I don't know, like nursing schools now, because it's like they come out of college, they're so thin skinned, and they're like, um, "Can I have a trigger warning? Can you let me know that there's gonna be some content here that I don't like?" It's like read the description, like it's yeah, like if you look at the cover for night nightwear, uh, it's pretty clear what it's about. It's pretty clear what you're getting into, <laughs> right? Yeah, I would think. I would think. But what what was the worst of your uh, of this criticism? Of this, I guess, backlash. It's, it hasn't really been a backlash. You just, I've just noticed there's been a you know book reviews today are written compared to they were five or ten years ago. It's different. Um, mm. You know, people come at. Books. I don't know if it's a, if it's a different reader group. I don't know if it's because you know it's a specific reviewer crowd that maybe didn't exist um, years ago. But yeah, you know, some of the reviews are just tone wise different than they used to be. Right. Um, and that's for for the old books as well as the new books, you know. But people people who like the kind of horror that I write like the kind of horror I write, and that's who I'm writing for. I, I'm not writing for mm-hmm. everyone. I'm, I'm not trying to right um, because on the contrary i mean while we talk about the i guess the negative feedback what about the positive feedback i mean you have a lot of books out there and i'm sure you're getting tons of people saying you know i've really enjoyed this book yeah there is and the thing with that's that's the crowd that i hope to please but you you always know and i mean we all feel this way you you pick up a book and you read it you love it and then you look to the author's next one or the last one and often it, it's, oh, it just isn't quite as good as that one. Well, a lot of times the, the story that brings you into an author or a director in movies, that first thing you read of them, it's like an introduction to a whole new world, a whole new language of that person's art. And so that moment, I think, can never 100% be recaptured. So anything that you read or watch in an artist's catalog after that is is often not going to quite stand up, even if you love it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, anytime I have a have someone say, oh, my God, Siren was my absolute favorite book of yours or Covenant was my favorite book of yours. You sort of know it in a certain level. I'm never going to top that for that person again. <laughs> but you hope you try. Right. Yeah, and, I totally understand those, that. For me, it was Anne and then Rice. again, I, I, I still do have. I also have people who you know. There's there's somebody I know who almost every book I write, that that's your best one. I'm like, you said that the last time. Mm. <laughs> See, you you made a fan with me here. I mean, I definitely need a. First off, I need to finish Covenant. It's a series. It's a it's a, it's a trilogy. I need to finish. You know, definitely read the other ones as well. But I might skip and start reading Nightwear uh, later on tonight, or maybe tomorrow, whatever I can. Um, <laughs> Now I just I'm looking at your Amazon page here. Now, are you in with uh, with the V Wars, uh, Jonathan Mayberry? Yeah, Jonathan invited me and a handful of other authors a, a long time ago now 
um, to write stories in this concept world he had called V Wars. Mm -hmm. And we did, it's, it's, they took the stories and kind of, we all had to reference characters and plot things that Jonathan had come up with so that it all hung together. But we really wrote independent stories. And then what they did is they sort of chopped those stories up and interspliced them throughout the book. So they were kind of like chapters of interlocking stories. Um, and it's it's a really weird way to me to have created a novel, but it worked. Um, I, when I read it, I was like, wow, this this is really cool that this whole shared world thing came together like that. And then a couple of years later, he said, hey, do you want to uh, write another V-War story for the third book? And I was like, hmm. Yeah, can I can I actually pick up one of my characters from the first one and and take her further? And he said, Yeah, so I did, and that came out in uh, V Wars Night Terrors. And then a couple more years went by, and a a board game came out, a comic book series was done, and then all of a sudden, it sold to Netflix. Yeah, I saw that, <laughs> and I was like, you know, at one point in time, it seems like a long time ago, Jonathan Mayberry was on the show. It was like. I was like, man, I'm talking to this guy. He, he's a legend, too. I mean, he, I'm not saying you're not either. I mean, you, you guys, there's a lot of authors there. They have a, they have established works, and your works are great as well. But it was like, man. But the guy was so down to earth. He was just he was just talking to us. It was great. We're talking about comics. We're talking about comics and uh, Captain America and, like, what they did with them and stuff. Like, Hell Hydra. It's like, what? What? Why is Captain America doing that? <laughs> you know? It was, no, it was great. No, it was great. Jonathan is one of the most amazing people and nobody has the kind of passion for comics and horror and just sort of the fantastic that jonathan does he's an amazing writer he's an amazing person and i you know i was honored to be able to work on two different books with him it was that it was is, amazing hey it, that, it brought me the first time any of my characters have ever ended up on tv because they did use snippets of my stories and my oh, characters nice. are actually in b wars so Unfortunately, they decided they're not renewing the series for a second mm. season, which sucks because I would really have loved to see where it went. But that's that's dumb. That's so dumb in Netflix. Uh. Okay, I got some more questions in the chat from the chat. Um, John, how many pinball machines do you have? Why? <laughs> and can I have one? That's a serious question. He has a, uh, uh -huh. a shipping address. Yeah, I'm sure he does. Um, <laughs> I have five. Um, and no, you can't. Uh, <laughs> they are all hard won. I've I've been, I got my first pinball machine in 2014, and it's it really brought me into the hobby where I realized there is a hobby. There's a whole subculture of pinball enthusiasts and pinball you know, these enthusiasts. Days, I like that. There there are conventions. My son and I go to two conventions a year, both of which are probably off the books this year, but typically. Um, and yeah, so little by little, I've I've totally gotten an understanding of both the game and all of the machines' histories, and I've looked for very specific machines that I want to own. Um, writing being a, a, a nice hobby that brings a little bit of income doesn't allow me to buy new pinball machines. I'll say that. It does. It it does allow you to buy buy new ones, or does Just it? not? No, uh. no. I mean, you know, the old games from which actually are the ones I like. The the games from the late seventies, early eighties, for whatever reason, that period of machine I absolutely love. Mm -hmm. um, the new machines obviously have way more electronics and bells and whistles and moving things and all that stuff. But my God, those machines are like six to eight grand if you want to buy. I one didn't of even those. know they still make them. Whenever I go to like oh, yeah. a Dave and Buster's, they have all these like. They look like cell phone apps as games. I'm like, what the fuck is this? What is this? <laughs> like, like my, there are more I, I places my though. Now that they've started that kind of uh, game restaurant kind yeah. of thing, yeah. Um, I've noticed a lot more of those places are are having pinball machines. The and the new ones too, which That's is nice because then, then you can the play places, them. You can't afford to own them, right? Shit, but yeah, pinball, pinball machines really did transition at a certain point. They stopped being made largely for businesses and started being made largely for the home user because the whole audience changed. Now, are you a master of these balls? I wish. Um, I, I'm a lot better now than I was before COVID. I can tell you that. Okay. So I have, many, I've spent many... about two hours a night for the last four months playing my machines. So how many balls can you handle once? 
I'm, I'm asking a serious question here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why you're laughing. Oh. It, it, it's um, a pinball question. How many balls can you hit all once? Uh, well, it, in my house, two, because I don't have a machine that does more than that. So, uh, <laughs> two is the right answer, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, but no, uh, pinball, pinball's fun. Pinball's fun. Uh, the other question is favorite B horror movie. I usually ask this question anyway towards the end, but I guess I ask it now. What is your favorite B horror movie? That is a tough question. Um, I'm a huge fan of Italian horror. So, I, yeah, I don't consider Argento B horror movies. Um, so otherwise I'd say Suspiria, but I think that's like premiere. Um, I could go Fulci's The Beyond. Um, I could go uh, uh, Gene Rollin, and I'm not saying his name right, but he was a French director who I love. Um and I don't speak French, so I don't have the accent. But Gene Rollins' uh, uh, Living Dead Girl has probably been one of my favorites forever. Um, so, yeah, anything by Rollin, Argento, Fulci, that's that's where I'm at. Living Dead Girl. I uh, don't know if I've seen the movie. You, you may have uh, heard the song, though, because Rob, Rob Zombie, Zombie. Yeah. references it very heavily. Hmm. Okay. Well... I'll, give, I'll definitely give that one a shot. Uh, that person was asking for uh, a quarantine movie recommendation, so uh, you know I'll, I'll give it a shot too. Uh, the Living Dead Girl. Hmm. All right. And also, what's subtitles. John's right. what's John's favorite type of horror to write? Monsters, demonic, demonic covenants, uh, ghosts, haunted house, werewolves. I don't really do werewolves. Um, I did one short story. I think only one short story that had a werewolf in it. And the werewolf wasn't even the main character. Um, uh, that's that's Bill Gagliani's territory. You're shaming, He's, you're, you're shaming werewolves, man. They have a place. No, I'm not. It's just it's not where I'm at. Um, like uh, W.D. Gagliani, who's up in Wisconsin. He's a great friend of mine. He's he's got a whole werewolf series that's awesome. Um, but it's it's not what I write. I, my thing is is demons. Um, most, demons. More more of my novels than not have some sort of demonic force in them. So. Now, demons for the oh go ahead I said demons for the wind demons for the wind okay and now I mean, were you always an agnostic um I've been a doubter since I was in kindergarten uh of uh, most people it's, yeah I would imagine <laughs> so it's like uh, Noah did what that doesn't make any sense <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I, I've always been the person who questioned everything. So, yeah, I'd like to, I mean, that, and that's the same thing with ghosts and everything else. Like okay. people ask me more, people ask me more, do you believe in ghosts? And I'm like, oh, not really. I have to tell you, I've never seen one. I've put myself in the position to see them in a million places. Cause I, I used to do live readings with Martin Mont. Uh, at a place in Chicago called the Red Lion Pub. And I was down there every week, and people supposedly uh, felt cold spots and and had all these apparitions. And I took um, another writer who was one of the people who says they, they can feel spirits and whatnot. I took her out to Bachelor's Grove Cemetery, which is where my novel The House by the Cemetery is ultimately set. Yeah. Um, that's supposed to be one of the most haunted places. I've been there many times. I've never felt anything. Resurrection Cemetery I've gone to where they supposedly you can see the fingerprints in the bars of the gate where a ghost tried to, you know, pry them apart. I I wish that I could like see them and because if I did, I probably would never write another horror thing again because I'd be scared to death. But I haven't seen it, so therefore I can't really say I believe it. You know, and that's that's the thing. Obviously, you know what I was getting at because it's like uh, with the with the demons. It's like I don't know if you have a religious background or if you, you draw from that, but it's like it doesn't really matter necessarily. Necessarily, you don't have to like have a religious background or even really believe to write demons. Nor do you have to believe in ghosts to write about ghosts. But people people will draw that. You know, they're like, I wonder if does he know? Has he seen a ghost before? Because he's really good at it. You know, he's really good about <laughs> writing ghosts. Uh, it's it's more like uh, John Everson's really good at entertaining you with what you want to be entertained with, 
and you want it to be real. It's so good. You well, I don't know if you want everything to be real. I gotta tell you, the Covenant. Oh, those ladies. Yeah, they could be real. They could be here, here and real right now. That'd be great. But the other stuff, no. The crazy cult, the crazy, it sounds like a crazy satanic Wiccan, well, Wiccan's not satanic, but, you know, cra crazy cult thing going down. I don't want that in my life, but it sounded very real, you know? It's supposed to be escapism. It's not supposed to be real. Exactly. And that's why when I see some of the critiques of, of horror or fantasy books or whatever, they're like, oh, come on, this would never happen. They're like, mm. no, of course it wouldn't. That's kind of the point. Right. Right. And it's like they're missing the, the missing that big point right there. And fiction's getting it kind of rough, too. Uh, I'm sorry, not fiction. Fantasy. When even um, fantasy races, like orcs, are being... It's like, guys, you know orcs are races now? Uh, okay. Yeah, something I heard, too, the other day. I was like, that I, doesn't make any sense. I, I don't even understand. I don't even understand. I don't. I, don't, I haven't read fantasy since probably I was shortly out of high school, so I don't yeah. I don't know the the scene there anymore. Yeah, I, I I don't I don't understand either. When I read that, I was like, that doesn't make any sense. It was like D and D. They're saying orcs are racist, but it's, that's weird because they have they literally have black human characters in D and D. So I don't understand what they're talking about. But I don't know. But people draw. They look at even fantasy and, and think it's real life. They look at horror and think it's real life. And I don't know. But um. What, what is? Oh, I mean, I always came to books because I want to escape and I want to, I want to go to a place that is not where I'm at right now. So yeah. I don't really want stuff to be real. Um, whether it could happen, you know, whether this person would ever really do that, kind of don't care. Mm. Um, <laughs> take me away. Take you away. And even the process of writing it, even process of writing that book. I mean, I'm sure when you're writing your characters and, and going into into the prose and all that, I'm sure it, it takes you away from the BS and the drama of your life, right? Yep, yep. It's it's a different place. It's uh, you're in your own own world. And in a way, I mean, for some writers, I'm. It, is it kind of therapeutic in a way too? Because like you can kind of, uh, I guess, I guess dump any sort of like I guess negative emotions you have built up of something else into your work or is it complete or is it is that not the case i think that happens sometimes i don't i don't think that that happens for me a lot but i can tell you um i have a new novel coming out this fall called voodoo heart mm -hmm. it's set in, it's set in new orleans and there's this one scene um where the detective has this kind of introspective dialogue with himself about losing his wife and how I'm not even going to go into what it is, but I came in, um, this is a weird connection, but I had been nursing a, a bird for literally months. You have, um, I, I, I've had pet birds my whole life basically. Ooh. And I had this one beautiful green, um, she was a, called a parakeet, but you would not like a budgie parakeet. Like you would think of, she looked more like a small parrot. Um, she was a different kind of breed of par parakeet. Um, there was something wrong with her from the time we got her, and I had her in and out of the vet for for weeks. And I would sit with her at night while she had pneumonia and was breathing like I thought she was going to die. And she finally died. Ultimately, she died in my hands, and it was it was an awful, awful thing. I'd spent so much time and effort trying to help nurse her back to health, and it just didn't work. The, the, um, bird, had, the bird had pneumonia. She had pneumonia. She had some sort of thing that was wrong with her inside, so she was constantly sick with something. Um, and we, she could never get diagnosed. We, you know, she was to the vet. I don't know how many times she was in an oxygen tent like four times. Um, point uh, of all this is, after all of this heartache with this bird, like I was broken up, and so I was out one day a few weeks later, and I heard a song from Pink on the radio. Um, and it's, I, I'm blanking on which one it is now, but it's something about a breakup and whatever. And the lyrics to that song spoke to me and they triggered me all the heartache that I'd had about the bird. And I came in, went straight out to my patio, sat down and I wrote this scene, which was totally about me losing a bird <laughs> <laughs> as the main character talking about his wife. 
<laughs> so yeah, in that sense, I did channel real emotion into what I hope is an intense sort of you know emotional scene that people read. Oh, and I'm sure it's going to pay off. I mean, you said you're working on this book now. Well, when does this book drop? No, no, that's it's oh, done. It's, it's done. It's in the can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this is uh, well, that comes out in October. In October. Okay. Okay. Now, birds. I have to say, I guess you've never seen the movie The Birds because I can't stand. Like, I'm horrified by birds. I, I, I've been scared to death because of that movie. I, I just uh, can't. I, I, no, no, no. Seagulls, no. man. Like, birds are. Birds are super cuddly. They want to go for your eyes, man. No. <laughs> I'm afraid of them. I have a I have a cockatiel who literally tugs at my ear all the time until I take her on my finger, put her up to my face under my nose, and scratch her head. And she snuggles in and just keeps oh. moving her head around as I'm scratching her. I mean, they oh. they can be super super cuddly pets. Okay. Wait. 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 See, people always say like, "Are you a dog person or a cat person?" But you're a bird person, so like, are, yep. So you don't go cats or dogs. You're bird. I'm I'm actually allergic to all things with fur, which is why I got birds in the first place. But man, yep, nothing with fur in my house. Nothing with fur, so no furries. Mm-mm. Hmm. Yeah, my my son wanted to watch My Little Pony. I was like, I don't know, son. That's a gateway to bronyism. I don't know. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's just best for them. Uh, he's only six. I was like, okay, fine, fine, right now. Uh, don't complicate things, son. <laughs> uh, Dad, I want to be a brony. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. But yeah, so yeah, I mean, that's, that has to be hard. A bird, a bird death. But you, you channeled that. You channeled that experience into your book. Okay, and I definitely want to check out Voodoo Heart when it drops. Any other teas? Anything else you can give us about Voodoo Heart? Um, it, it's kind of, uh, it's again, it's sort of a detective noir kind of book, mm -hmm. um, but with voodoo. So, uh, it actually started out back in 2003. Um, I wrote a short story called Vigilantes of Love for my second short story collection. Okay. And, uh, it was about this detective and the editor of that book at the time told me, you know, this really should be a longer story. You should, you could make it a book. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not what I want to do. And, you know, 10 years later, I actually wrote an outline for it. And almost 10 years after that, I finally actually wrote the book. Um, so it's kind of fun. It's, you know, it's a, it's a detective who's, uh, he, he lost his wife to this weird freak thing where he woke up and his bed was like just blood where she used to be. Oh, wow. And now every month on the night of the full moon, that's what's happening throughout New Orleans. And he keeps getting called to all of these places. And there's there's a bloody bed and a heart left behind. And nobody can find the bodies. Ooh, man. That's a that's a good premise right there. Uh, so th the bodies are just gone. They just leave a bunch of blood and heart and a heart there. Yep. yep. And if they did, like, so I guess if they did DNA on the heart, it's the heart of the, of the victim. That's that's what ultimately we assume, although they haven't proved that at the start. Hmm. Ooh, man. That is pretty good. So, yeah, check out Voodoo Heart in October, guys, because uh, I don't know about you, but that has me hooked right there. <laughs> good. That's a that's pretty good. I because think about like that. Think about that. Just waking up next to your loved one would be your, your wife or fiance or girlfriend. or I don't know if you're if you're, you're into dudes, a boyfriend or if you check a boyfriend. But you wake up next to them and they're, they're gone. It's just a bloody mess and a heart. Wow. Just like that. Just like that. Man. All right, I got some more questions from the chat. Do you listen to music while you write? And what kind of music is your favorite? Always. Um, I, listen, uh, is, I, I want more ethereal kind of stuff because I don't want to listen too heavily to the words. So... I listen to Cocteau Twins and Delirium and Conjure One and um, a, a lot of really ambient kind of stuff. Mm. And this is while you're writing, like while you're putting the, the words to the page. Oh, yeah. I don't I don't write without music on. I mean, seriously, I I often um, write in bars because I need to get out of the house. So I'm not 
playing with my birds or talking to the family or whatever. So when I'm really hard at work on a project, a lot of times I'll pick one night a week where after my day job, I go straight to a bar, sit in the corner and work for four hours and get a chapter done. Um, that's called writing night. And, you know, people bring you finger food and a beer and you can't go anywhere and do anything but sit in the booth. So I get a lot of stuff done then and I get beer. Uh, but part of the point of this is that the selection of where I go to write has an awful lot to do with what music they play. Um, because I can't sit in a bar where no music is playing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't want to sit in a country Western bar, frankly, it's not my thing. Um, so, so I'm always like on the lookout for, is I used to travel a lot more for work too. So I'd come back after the day to the, to the convention hotel and I'd be like, I don't want to sit in a hotel room and I'd go out and I'd find an Irish bar or something and I'd write there until the wee hours and then go back to work in the morning. Um, so yeah, music's really important to me and, and the music does change book by book. Like when I was writing Siren, I made a very conscious effort to listen a lot, uh, to Cocteau Twins because for those who know them, the lead singer is like really ethereal it's beautiful and like you can't understand any of the words she's saying um because she almost sounds like she's singing in a foreign language even though it really is english just perfect kind of music to evoke a siren right Mm -hmm. so i i did that a lot for that book for nightwear i was listening to a little more heavier industrial stuff um like covenant not really industrial but you know more uh more darker I listen to a lot of The Cure. I listened to uh, uh, their dark albums over and over and over again when I was writing uh, Nightwear. Um, the current book, I'm back to more delirium kind of stuff. Voodoo Heart, I listened to, you know, I tried to listen to some more uh, you, Cajun stuff now. And then. Cajun? Maybe some yep. jazz? Like any, any jazz? A little bit, yeah. Okay. I can see it would probably have that sort of the flavor to it. Now, some writers listening might be like, wait, wait, you actually write in a bar? Probably still stuck on that. You write in a bar? <laughs> like, but <laughs> like, no distractions? Like, the people don't mess with you? They don't come up to flirt? Like, what are you doing? No? Actually, that does happen sometimes. It used to happen more when I, there was one place that I went to. I liked to go there because they had good finger food and good music. And they usually had, like, a live guitar performer by the end of the night. Mm-hmm. Um but that also was a college hangout, and there were many times when it crowded up so much that I'd end up with people right there in the booth with me, and they'd be like, hey, what are you doing? What are you? And that's when you know it's time to leave. Ah. Uh, <laughs> I'm working on my novel. What, am I going to be in your book? That's you, so pretentious. You are, uh, I'm you, writing a novel. <laughs> what would you say? <laughs> I mean, I'll tell people, yeah, I'm, I'm working on, on a novel. That's what I do, oh. and I always would have my... I'd always have my postcards with my books and stuff on them. So if people were really interested, I'd hand them one and be like, yeah, maybe they'll go buy one and, and like it. But Hey, cool. Cool. And they'll be like, hey, can I be a character? Am I going to be in your book? I don't even know who you are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, it's as amusing as that could be sometimes, it's really not what you want to happen because that stops your the whole reason you're there. All right. Now, one question I, I definitely – I already asked what's your favorite horror movie uh, well, no, actually, you didn't. More, more like the chat asked, "What's your favorite B hard movie?" Okay, what Zach. is your favorite? What is two two questions I definitely have left, left for you? One, is there something in the writing or publishing or or in hard that grinds your gears, irritates you, whatever? We can vent about that for a little bit. And what is your favorite hard movie? Uh, whichever one you want to do first. Uh, I'll do the movie first because that's okay. easier. <laughs> okay, I've. And my question is, is answer, I should say, is, is Pat at this point. It's Alien. Oh, um, Alien is nice. Because Alien combines, Alien is both my favorite science fiction movie and my favorite horror movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's both. And mm-hmm. hugely impactful movie. It's, it's genius on so many levels. It's, it's moody. It's scary. Um, you know, you love the character. You're afraid of the monster. It's, it's awesome all the way around. Um, but then I also still, because I called this out before, um, you know, from Italian horror, Suspiria. Um, the 4K restoration that uh, came out mm, two years ago from Synapse Films mm-hmm. is freaking phenomenal. Um, they, I always liked the movie, and when I saw the 4K version of it, 
I love the movie. I've watched it so many times since then. It is absolutely beautiful. The colors in that movie and the mood are insane. The so, colors are great. Go. I mean, the colors are extremely vivid. Yep. I mean, they always were, but when they when they upgraded it, it's like holy crap to see that on a plasma screen. It's it's unbelievable. It's gorgeous. Um, the other question was, what grinds my gears about horror? Oh. Either horror writing or the pu- something on the publishing, uh, you know, publishing scene. I don't know. To me, it's sort of the publishing scene. I, I, it, I, I'm not upset about anything other than, you know, I think the whole industry has changed so much. Um, mm. And it's it's the the things that I did to get ahead in the industry back in the day, like wouldn't do anything now um everything's changed the way you succeed is different um this the competition is is way different because you're instead of just you know competing with people who were selected um by you know agents and editors you're competing with basically everybody on your block right uh, because everybody in the world is uploading things and trying to get noticed so that I, i think the the worst thing about publishing right now is that it's there are so many voices it's next to impossible to get heard. I can't imagine just starting out in publishing now. Um, at this point, I at least, you know, I've been at this for over 25 years. I, I don't have a ginormous audience, but I do have an audience. And, and there are people who like to see what I write every year. And it's nice to know that there's somebody out there who's going to want to read your book when you finish it. That is good to know. That, that is a good feeling to have, that knowing that people are going to read your book. Uh, and you're right. It, it has changed quite a bit. I mean, self-publishing has made it extremely easy for people to just put whatever they want on there. Um, you know, it's uh, it changed the game. Yep. I mean, I say yep. this. I, I like I do publish books. I publish more anthologies, like collections of short stories. Like you know what that is, but some people don't know what that is. You know, it's like what's an anthology? A collection of short stories of from other authors, you know, because anymore I feel like I'm, I'm selling books to people who don't even read. You know, that's the other thing, you know, like readership seems to be like it, it more people have a Kindle more than ever, but it's like, are they really reading with that Kindle? What are they doing with it? <laughs> you know, are they watching porn with it? Are they playing games? Like, what are they doing? Um, but it's, it's like, but yeah, it, it's changing as, as a publisher. I, I know that, anymore i'm just like a middle guy that so like you could just have success you could find success it takes a lot of work a lot of work and chance and luck to if you if you go the self-published route and some people have had success with that but it's like it, it's it's not easy it's not like you just put it up there and then, and then boom you're done no you got to put it up there and then you have to market it you have to get people to find it direct people to it now, the old adage, it takes money to make money, uh, is is very true for publishing. And that's why, you know, I've, I I know people have had great success at self-publishing and more power to them. And, and that's awesome. Me, I don't, I do keep a full-time day job and I have to devote most of my energy to that. So I can't give my writing the marketing department, you know, that a self-published author needs to have. Um, you need to have money, you need to have feet on the ground constantly doing that. So I would way rather actually give that to a real publisher who has bank, who has you know copy editors and an art department for covers and a marketing department to actually you know sell the book and get it into bookstores. That's why there are publishers, and I respect that, and I, I want that professional uh, section of publishing to succeed because when they succeed, I succeed. Um, and I can't succeed nearly as well on my own. I, I do too as well. Though, and sometimes, sometimes it happens where you hear about a publisher not paying people. It's like, come on, guys, do that. The one thing you can do is at least pay the, the authors. Hey, if you're making money off the work, pay them. <laughs> it's, uh-huh. it's their work too, you know. Uh, I guess that doesn't that doesn't help. That, that hurts things. That's that's my thing. That that's what irritates me. Uh, is when, when I guess, publishers put a bad name for other publishers out there. 
uh, because that happens. I, I hear that. I read that on um, you know various groups on Facebook. Whatever, be like, oh, I, I used to go through small publishers or indie publishers, but then I did. I didn't get paid or whatever. It's like, well, what was the contract? What do y'all agree to? And it's like, you know, it's like if the agreement was to pay, didn't pay. That's it. That's simple. I mean, if you're making yep. money off it, if you're not making money, then just tell them, hey, you know what? I got your book out there, your story out there. I hate to tell you, I don't know. It, it didn't sell any. What can I tell you? You know, it's bad news, but at least you're being honest. I've got another right. question from the chat here. Has quarantine led to more writing or new ideas for future stories? Uh, not more writing because I hit quarantine at a weird time. Um, I had just finished up Voodoo Heart a few weeks before then. And literally the week that everyone went on lockdown was the week I was supposed to be in New Orleans for another business meeting. And I had was getting uh, my page proofs from the publisher that week. So I was like, oh, this is going to be really cool. I'm going to actually at, look at the copy edits of Voodoo Heart in New Orleans at one of the bars, which I actually wrote into the book. The, how how perfectly complete of a circle is that? Because I actually, I, to, for it to be a circle, you have to know, I actually started the book at a specific bar in New Orleans over a year ago. Um, so to have done, been able to do copy edits there would have been amazing. Instead, oh, we went nice. on lockdown, the meeting was canceled, and I did my page proofs at home in March. Um, so, you know, March was not writing, it was editing. Mm. Um, and then April was working on, it, it was more ideas for future stories because after I took a couple of weeks off and just played pinball, um, I said, okay, well, <laughs> I got to start pitching some ideas for what the next novel is. So then I did work on, uh, creating a couple of outlines, um, and ultimately sold those. So I'm actually now working on my 13th novel because I do have a contract for it. So. So, but I can't say like the first two months of quarantine, I didn't do much writing at all. I was, I was editing and just looking for ideas. Okay. And, oh, and one more question. I, I missed this one. It was in the chat. Um, what are, what good books are, i oh, sorry. Well, the question is kind of botched. Um, what books are good for? Um, in, oh, I'm seeing escape? the question. Yeah. I think he, he was oh, commenting when oh, I was talking what books earlier are good for, about uh, escape. Never mind. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was a question, but. She, sorry, yeah, Patty. She. Yeah, Patty. <laughs> I'm, I'm she has mod status now. too, so <laughs> I should I should know. But yeah, so yeah, books are meant for uh, entertaining escape. Uh, that's just rehitting a, a point that we talked about earlier on the show. I try to keep it more an hour long because podcast link that's kind of what's what's doable really. But um, John Everson has been great talking to you. Uh, like I said. I, I fell in love with Covenant. I need to finish it and definitely re read the other two. It's definitely building up. Each chapter is like, it gets more intense. It gets more intense. And it's, it starts off with small town secrets in that, that cave that the people just kept on committing suicide off of. And the cops didn't care. The cops didn't care. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but there's I, always a reason. There's always a reason, man. There's always a reason. I was reading that story. And uh, I, I definitely want to read more. And Nightwear is on my mind now, too. Uh, and Voodoo Heart, I want to see that when it, when it drops. So cool. if anything happens from the show, you at least have a few more purchases from me and hopefully from other <laughs> people that listen to it as well. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Those that listen to it, uh, press the thumbs up button, share, subscribe. And if you're listening to, to this on the podcast feed, leave a comment, rate, all that. It helps. Anyway, you guys, ladies, take it easy.